your goodness I would be desperate without your love slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross oh in Jesus cause you have a
slave to sin, Jesus died He no longer sees a broken mess. He sees his son because we are clothed in his righteousness. And that's why we can sing this next part together. Say, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. We sing, I am chosen. Thank you so much to the worship team for preparing our hearts for the message to come now. And I'm going to begin that message in just a matter of minutes. But before I do, let me just share a few thoughts with you as we get ready to get started. The first thing I want to share with you is I'm not here to make a statement about my opinions. I mean, first of all, if that's what I was doing, I'd be the craziest man in America. Because in this environment where things are heard through so many different filters, 
for another person, especially another white man, to speak his opinions, it, it would just be crazy. And I'm always aware of this, not just tonight, but I'm always aware that whenever I get ready to speak to you here at New Spring, nobody comes here to hear my opinions. That's the thing. We live in a world today where Christian leaders are encouraged to make statements. But the truth of the matter is, we're not here to state our opinions. If you're, if you're a God-called man or woman in the ministry, your responsibility is to speak for God. And too many people are saying too much and speaking into issues that they don't fully understand. And I don't want to add my name to that list. But I didn't intend to bring this message. I had to take Mary Alice to an appointment in Kansas City and wound up sitting outside like we all do these days. And I was in the car for a couple hours. And thankfully, it's just a minor medical issue. But in that time, it was like the Holy Spirit of God just began to speak heavily to me. And I felt like God was giving me a message for our church. Now, that's the second thing that I want to say. I'm, I'm going to talk about America tonight, but I'm not really speaking to America. I mean, there are other leaders that have been called to do that. I'm a pastor of a church, and specifically to New Spring Church. And I know there are many of you who are watching around the world tonight who are not New Springers, but I just want you to understand that I'm going to be talking to Christ followers tonight. You know, we have many people who attend our services who are not yet Christ followers. And I always want to make sure that I have something of value, even if a person is not a Christ follower. But probably more than any other message I'm ever going to bring, tonight's message is for Christ followers, because we're going to talk about solutions. And quite frankly, the solutions we're going to talk about are dependent upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if we don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, if he's not our Lord, what I'm going to talk about tonight will not make a whole lot of sense. It's hard to respond to a relationship you don't have yet. My prayer is that you'll hear it wherever you come from, whether you're a committed Christ follower or if you've just checked in tonight and you're not sure yet what you believe or whether or not Jesus is your Lord. But, but I do want to make it really clear that I'm talking to Christ followers tonight. The last thing I'm going to say before I get started is if you're going to listen at all, I ask you to listen to the whole message. Now, I understand, of course, that because of circumstances, you, know, you may not be able to hear it straight through. I mean, you've got young parents that we put putting kids to sleep, and some of you are at work, and you won't be able to hear it all in, in one setting. I, I certainly understand that, but this will be posted online, and so here's my point. In this, in this world in which we live right now, where every word is parsed and, and <laughs> opinions are thrown out about everything, um, I want to make sure that you hear the whole message. I, I'm perfectly willing to defend the whole message in context. I'm not interested in defending snippets of it that are out of context. That's, that's neither here nor there, but the important thing is I want you to hear the whole message because as I know my heart tonight, and I'm speaking from my heart, I believe I'm bringing the message to you that God has. I asked the worship team, they, they prayed for me before the service, but I asked the worship team to especially pray that I could keep my composure. Because from the first time I started working on that message on Monday all the way through yesterday, and even up till this afternoon, I haven't been able to stop crying. Because as soon as I get into this, the tears just start coming and I can't stop crying. But tonight, I want to keep my composure because I have a lot to say. So here we go. America, and the whole world for that matter, but especially America, is in deep trouble. In addition to the ordinary problems that we face all the time, we're going through, or we've been through, wherever we are, a plague, a pandemic, the coronavirus. And our economy is in a mess. I saw that maybe 30 million people have lost their jobs, and that has still yet to shake out in the pain that a lot of people are feeling. China, which has been iron-fistedly crushing their own citizens, especially persecuting Christians, if anybody's been paying attention the last five years, is now openly threatening us with various kinds of attacks. Well, that would have been enough trouble. 
But then that horrible, unspeakable thing happened to George, George Floyd in Minnesota. Right before our eyes. Unavoidable. The senseless murder of an American citizen. Another white aggressor with his knee crushing the throat of a black victim. And if that had been an isolated incident, it would have been enough to devastate us. But we know all too well in America that it's not isolated. And now America is seething. And it's typical for us Americans. The air is filled with noise, especially in media and on the Internet. And all kinds of people are, are making all kinds of statements. And then, of course, those statements get scrutinized by the social media police to check if the person talking had a right to make the statement, said too much, not enough. And the result from that is just more noise. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of pain that they're expressing. And we need to set that aside and honor it for what it is. But a lot of the noise that we hear are millions of armchair spectators and Americans virtue signaling. You know, if that's a new term, virtue signaling means the act of public, publicly expressing opinions intended to demonstrate one's good character or the moral correctness of one's position on a particular issue. Real quickly, there's, there's everything right about signaling our virtue if we truly have virtue. But I think you and I know when we think about the moral and spiritual condition of our nation, we're a nation that's morally bankrupt. And there are a lot of people who really don't have strong interest in this who enjoy the sport of communication. My heart is broken tonight because as I look at a nation that I love, here, here's the question that keeps coming to my mind. Do we even know what's wrong? You know, sometimes I feel like you know, for all of you who have toddlers, you know what it's like when they cry and they're hurting, but they don't know how to tell you what's wrong. And when I look at America, I really wonder, do we know what's wrong? And I'm sure even as I ask that question that there's a rush of thoughts into that vacuum. But I'm, I'm asking this question, do we really know what's at the core, what's absolutely wrong with us? I was already worried about this. I was worried about it with the coronavirus. When the coronavirus came, I really had a sense that God was trying to get our attention. And I had prayed that in this season that there would be repentance and that we would turn from our sins and turn from our wickedness. We would turn from our wicked ways. I even taught several times in our series and even leading up to Easter on 2 Chronicles 7.14. My people, which are called by my name, will turn from their wicked ways. I had hoped that that would happen in America. I hope we would get a clue. But in the last few weeks, as we started coming out of the coronavirus, it was, it was clear to me that we weren't learning the lesson. We, we suffered the pain, but we didn't learn the lesson. And now we're here. And I still don't see America learning anything. We tend to focus on symptoms. And then we look at those symptoms through the lens of our politics. As our nation falls apart tonight, Part of this is coming from the heart of an old man. I'm 63. I've seen all this before. What we see happening in America tonight has happened before. And if all we do is we focus on symptoms, nothing is going to change. What happens is we argue about the symptoms. And that means if there is any kind of action, we wind up just putting Band-Aids on cancer. And of course, anytime you put Band-Aids on cancer, the symptoms come back worse than ever. And so in the midst of all this crisis that we're dealing with, I have to wonder, do we as a nation even know what's wrong? Can we even diagnose our disease? Because if we can't diagnose our disease, we won't know what the cure is. When I started tonight, I shared with you that I was going to talk to Christians. And let me be real honest. It would be one thing if godless people didn't get it. We would understand that. If godless people couldn't discern and be perceptive and know what's wrong, we would say it's because they don't know God. 
But it seems to me most Christians don't know what's wrong. And what really puzzles me as a leader who speaks in many many areas of Christian leadership, our Christian leaders don't seem to know what's wrong. I keep wondering, is it that we know and we're afraid to say? Or is it that we don't know? Well, again, I know there are many Christian leaders all over the country and around the world who watch our ministry. So let me speak to people like me for a moment. Let me, let me speak to Christian leaders. There are a lot of verses in the Word of God that keep me up at night. I mean, these are just verses that God speaks directly to communicators for him. He holds us to a higher standard. And there's a particular chilling scripture from the book of Ezekiel about preachers who won't tell the truth at a time when the truth is unpopular. The Bible says, because you've confounded and confused good people, and because you made it easy for others to persist in evil, so they wouldn't even dawn on them to turn to me so I could save them, as of now, you're finished. No more delusion mongering from you, no more sermonic lies. I'm going to rescue my people from your clutches, and you'll realize that I am God. So to all of us who are preachers, all of us who are communicators, Bible teachers, It's really critical for us that we don't just say what we feel like will allow us to float along the stream of social media. We've been called to speak for God. I know I may be vilified for this message, but I'm going to sleep just fine tonight based on what we just read out of Ezekiel. A long time ago, I decided I wasn't going to worry about criticism. I was going to worry about being wrong. And I really believe, by the grace of God, as many flaws as I I have, and they are many, I believe I've lived with that. (laughs) One of the interesting things that gets back to me, you know how it is when you're, you know, you can imagine being in my world when you're communicating, you communicate, you know, hundreds of times. People say things about you, and it gets back to me. I mean, I love it when people will say, well, I felt like Mark was talking just to me, but <laughs> that's a good thing. But one of the statements that I've heard that's been said about me is I've heard people say, I can't figure out Mark's politics. <laughs> well, I'm sure that is a challenge because a long time ago, I decided to follow the word of God. And <laughs> the word of God just picks strange times to put me in various political places. Earlier this year, and this is too much information, within one week, I got hate mail because there were those who said they figured that I was supporter of President Trump, out and out supporter. And within a few days, I got hate mail because someone said I was disrespectful to the president. Well, I, I don't have the calling to be political. I have the calling to preach the word of God. And so consequently, I can understand why someone could say, I can't figure out Mark's politics because I'm not a politician. That's just not my job. When politicians do the right thing, they'll get my praise, regardless of where they are. When they do the wrong things, I'll speak against it. And when it doesn't have to do with the word of God, I'll stay out of it. I know the pressure that preachers feel, and it's nothing new. In Isaiah chapter 30, The Bible talks about a a, a group of times or a group of years that are very similar to the times that we live in. God says the people tell the prophets, don't tell us what is right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. Forget all this gloom. Get off your narrow path. Stop telling us about your Holy One of Israel. Well, when I read verses like that, I recognize that God has called me to give the Word of God. So again tonight, I'm not playing to any crowds. I'm not playing to any particular point of view, my job as best I can is to share with you the message that God gave me. And so I've asked the question, what is our diagnosis? What is wrong with us? I'm going to take a deep breath. What's wrong with America is the judgment of God is falling upon us because of our wickedness. That is what's happening. The judgment of God is falling upon this nation because of our wickedness. 
When the coronavirus epidemic hit, I was asked that question a whole lot. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I kind of ducked the question. I said, well, I don't know if it's the judgment of God or it isn't. And I, I really didn't know for sure. I suspicioned that it was. I felt that it was because I felt like it fit into prophetic times, in which, by the way, a week from this weekend, we start a brand new prophecy series called Signs of the Times. So when I looked at what was happening in the world, I sensed that it was God's judgment. But now there's no doubt. The crises that we're experiencing in the United States are pancaking on America, one on top of the other. And there's no doubt now. I mean, this, this bears all the marks of God's judgment upon a nation that we read about in the Bible. Do you ever read the books of the prophets? I mean, for those of you who read through the Bible in the year, you know that's a pretty big section. You know it starts Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Omadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. It's a long section. When you look at the books of the prophets, it's roughly the same size as the New Testament. And when you read the books of the prophets, what you read over and over is God is pleading with his people, turn from your wickedness and turn back to me. And if you don't, I'm going to bring judgment upon you. I mean, a section as big as the New Testament. God says that over and over and over. And if he would do that with his own people, how much more would he do that to America? Billy Graham used to say this when I was a little kid. He would say, if God doesn't bring judgment on the United States, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was our nation as Billy Graham saw it back in the 50s. Why are preachers reluctant to say that this is God's judgment on America. I remember when 9-11 happened. A great Christian leader in our nation, the night of 9-11, said, this is the judgment of God. Whoa! It was like a blast furnace of criticism. And this leader backed up a little bit. And I understand what happened and See, here's the problem. We have a hard time distinguishing between individual judgment and judgment upon a nation. And, and so when, when people heard this leader say that, he, they, they said, well, perhaps he's saying that the people who died deserved judgment. But that's not what he was saying. He was saying there is a time when God judges a whole nation. After all, when you look at the prophets, prophets who prophesied for God got carried away into captivity with everyone else. And people... Like I said, it was a blast furnace. How dare this leader say that this is God's judgment on us? But I remember thinking at the time, what proof do we have that it's not the judgment of God? Frankly, all those things that Americans said was just bravado. It was Americans saying, how dare God judge us? And if the Bible teaches us anything, this is a suicide question for a nation. There is a, many verses in the Bible about God's judgment, but there's one verse that I think about often. In Romans chapter 1, God, the Holy Spirit, has Paul to write about what's wrong with the world and the importance of salvation. I want to pull one verse, Romans 1.18. Some people will say, well, God is a God of love, and it's true, but God is also equally a God of judgment. The Bible says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, watch these two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's one of the biggest verses in the Bible, but there are three things that stand out to me that I want to share with you tonight. God is angry, and we know what he's angry at. He's angry at ungodliness, which is living like God doesn't exist and like his commands don't matter. And he's also angry at unrighteousness. And what's interesting about that is ungodliness is about our relationship with God. Unrighteousness is about our relationship with our fellow man. Interestingly, the word unrighteousness there means injustice. As God looks down at America tonight, he is angry at people living like his word does not matter, like he has not got anything to say about how we live our lives, and he's angry at the way we are treating each other. 
And I, I'm going to, I'm going to step in it right now. Does it strike you like it strikes me that God indicts both elements of our left and our right in American politics? We have one side that's better on social justice issues, but that side often is very ungodly in its idea of what God has to say about wrong and right. And we have another side that articulates right kind of living, but sometimes that side is weak when it comes to justice. I mean, if, if we pick up on anything there, it, it is that we all have a sin nature, and we live in a world where it's easy for one side to look at the other and say, you're the problem, and the other side to look and say, you're the problem, and does it strike us that God is upset with ungodliness, disregarding God? I mean, we've decided that Marriage isn't a man and a woman anymore, and we've decided that there aren't just man and woman, that there are 70 different genders and all kinds of silliness like that. It's ungodliness, but he's also upset at the injustice in the way that we're treating each other. The second thing that stands out to me is that God is upset with all ungodliness and all injustice. This is where I'm having to take a Big look at my own life. <laughs> my problem is I want to focus on some ungodliness and some unrighteousness, but God is saying he's angry at all. And now the third thing that stands out to me. When I read that verse to you a few moments ago, I read to you the wrath of God is revealed. Now, that word for revealed means literally taking off the wraps pulling off the wrapper. And the Bible tells us that that's what's going on right now. The anger of God is building up at our ungodliness and our injustice, and God now is beginning to take the wraps off. So when we look at what's going on in America tonight, we should not be surprised. And someone will say, well, Mark, surely, surely not America you know what the Word of God says? The Bible says the wicked will go down to the grave. This is the fate of all nations who ignore God. You tell me. You see the same nation I see. I love America. I love it with all my heart. But this nation ignores God. I fear that our churches are ignoring God. I feel that our preachers or ignoring, I, I may be guilty as much as anybody else. I pray not. But we, we just live in a world that is so steeped in popular opinion, in social media, which has its place. But the Bible tells us that the fate of all nations, including the United States, that ignore God, will go down to the grave. But God adds this, but the needy will not be ignored forever. The hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. So if that's the diagnosis, that what we're going through with all these things, with all these pancaking catastrophes on our nation tonight, if that's the diagnosis, what's the cure? Well, first comes a massive question. Do we want a cure? Do we want a solution? Right now, we have violence all across our nation. And tragically, we see violence tends to beget violence. And we all look at what's happening and we know the sad reality that even though we can understand that there's great pain Unless something changes, we're going to have violence responding to violence and nobody is going to win. The question is, do we want a solution? We have political leaders, especially in this political season, posturing and making speeches. And, and I wonder sometimes, do, do some of them really want a solution? Or, or do, they, do they want to pander to the particular group that tends to follow them? Well, let's talk to us. We can't talk to them tonight. 
if leaving God out got us here, it's clear that we're not going to get out of trouble without bringing him back. You know, when the United States was formed, Benjamin Franklin at the Constitutional Congress said this. He said, if a sparrow cannot fall from the sky without God's notice, how can a great nation hope to rise without his blessing? And it's true today. We're not going to get out of trouble unless we bring God back to his rightful place. <laughs> Somebody could say, well, Mark, Christians all know that. Do we? Do we really? Years ago, there was an atheist group that bought the <laughs> signs on the side of buses in an American city, maybe several American cities. It was during the Christmas season, they had this slogan on it, you can be good without God. Oh, boy, Christians cried out against that. But when I look back after all these years in America, it seemed to me that those atheists got their point across because most Americans, at least many Americans, seem to believe that you can somehow be good without God. Worse yet, it feels to me like a lot of the church is starting to articulate that. If we're going to heal from this disease, we need to start here. Number one, we need a change of direction. We need a change of mind. In the Old Testament, that word repent indicates a change of direction. In the Greek and the New Testament, it's a change of mind, but it's the same thing. We, we desperately need a change. And when the Bible talks about repentance, it talks about repenting before God and repenting before our fellow man. And in this culture today that leaves God out, and there are those who feel that we can be good without God, they would say that repenting toward our fellow man is adequate. Forget about God, just make things right with your fellow man. But the truth is, it's not adequate. Because if it just comes down to repenting before our fellow man, we'll do what humans do. We'll do it, but on our own terms. And nothing will really change. The question of this hour is, do black lives matter? And that's not a new question. It's a question that's been staring America in the face for over 400 years. And we've never really given a real answer to that question. Do black lives matter? And the answer is a resounding yes, but that's not enough. If we were atheists, that might be enough. If we were existentialists, that might be enough. Let me tell you why. Atheists who believe in a pure Darwinian or pure naturalistic explanation for life, there can never be any purpose to life. It is just, if you have one, you have the other. If there's no God, then there's no purpose. Of course, we live in the age of existentialism. And existentialism is an adapter kit on atheism because existentialists like us, we don't want to admit that if there is no God, then there's no purpose. So what existentialism means in broad brush strokes, it just means that, well, there's no purpose, but we'll make it up as we go. But all existentialists, if they're honest with themselves, know deep inside that it's all made up. So if there's no God and there's no creator and all we are is dust in the wind, we're all products of godless evolution, then it might be enough to say black lives matter. But repentance before God says more. Repentance before God says black lives are precious. Black lives are sacred because our creator has created black lives. How dare someone hate or rage or damage God's creation? Do black lives matter? Yes, they do. But black lives are precious and black lives are sacred. Anything short of this being a divine conviction means this moment will come and go. And when all the smoke is cleared, it'll just add up to rhetoric. People will ask, did I post the right words? No, I'm not diminishing that. Words can be helpful. Words, good words are important. 
But in this age where words come so easily, if our hearts don't change, we're going to be right back here again and again and again. It starts when we repent before God. And we repent of all our ungodliness. We repent of all the areas of our life where we've said to God, you don't sit on the throne, I sit on the throne. Whether it's my sexuality or it's my money or if it's my leisure time or if it's my view of life, God, you're not on the throne, I'm on the throne. Repentance before God says, God, I need a change of direction. And it's a repentance before God that leads to a change of heart toward our fellow men. Number two, we hear often, and it's well said, that we need to listen so that we can understand. That is so true, and it's so essential, and it will help. But once again, for Christ followers, it's not enough. One more time, we need to listen, we need to understand, it's vital. Why is it not enough? Let's be honest. No matter how hard we try to understand, we will always come short. No, no matter how hard anyone tries, no white person can fully ever understand the black experience in America. But then that's true in general. There's no man who can understand a woman. There's no woman who can understand a man. There's no child that can fully understand a parent. And then on top of that, even within race and gender, we're not the same. But once again, we need to try our best to understand. And there are experiences that we have that are common. And yes, we need to understand those to the best of our ability and struggle all our lives to understand our fellow man, our fellow woman, and to walk with them to the extent that we can. That's essential. And it'll help. But it's not enough. Because if it's all we do, it'll wind up being complete and we'll wind up doing it on our own terms. God knew we would never fully understand each other. So he gave us something much higher than understanding. He gave us love. See, love, love is the express lane. Even when we can't understand, we love. Yeah. Oh, I know that the moment I say that, the word love has been so pulled out of shape that it's going to be hard for us to process that. I mean, frankly, if you listen to the music of our times and the entertainment of our times, love is a, is a synonym for sex. Every once in a while, I've spoken in a format where there was a Q&A session and, and it was a secular environment and people would know what I believed about what the Bible had to say about sexuality. And one of the questions I would get asked is, why can't I love whoever I want to love? <laughs> First thought I have is, of course you can love whoever you want to love. Of course we should love everyone, not just those whom we want to love. But I knew the question they were asking and I would say, well, if you're asking me, can I have sex with whoever I want to have sex with, that's that calls for a different discussion, but the truth of the matter is we can love everyone. Christ followers of all races and all backgrounds, do you want to know if you really love? Then we must let God define it. The Bible says love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep records of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. We want a cure tonight? Yes. Oh, by all means, shall, can we listen? Listen to, 
listen to those who are hurting and grieving and do our best to understand. But understand that's still not enough. That God has called us to love each other. First of all, we need to repent before God. America, American Christians of our ungodliness and our injustice. Number two, determined to love one another. And number three, with everything that's going on, all the brokenness in our culture, God has called the church to be a different kind of place. Too often, churches are places of turmoil and sectarianism and prejudice. How wrong is that? The church was always meant to be a family of all peoples and all races and all backgrounds. I mean, that is the whole idea for Je that Jesus had for the church was that he would call us out as flawed, broken people from every background in every situation and every tongue in every language, the book of Revelation says, and that we would gather together in the love of Jesus and that when people would walk in among us, they would say there's something different there. That burden has been on my heart as a pastor, especially the last five years. I'm not saying I'm a smart person. I just really believe God gave me this sense. I had a sense of where we were headed, and I just prayed, oh, God, make New Spring Church. Make New Spring Church a place where people meet that love each other, and even though there's pain and difficulty and anger and even, yes, hatred outside our walls, may we be a different kind of people. As I shared with you at the beginning, most of the time that I've worked on this message, I've just sat and cried while I typed. And as I said one more time at the beginning, this is a message not for, it's not a political statement, it's not to the outside world, this is to Christians, this is to Christ followers. We got to get right. Our hearts have to be right. <laughs> we Christians are so good with the us versus them thing. And it could be that someone, you know, tuned in tonight and said, Mark, I hope you tell them what they need to hear, depending upon one's personal viewpoint. Well, I hope I've spoken the truth to everybody. I know I have from God's word. But <laughs> I don't need to think about them other people, I need to look at my own heart. I need to weep before God. I need to be broken before God. The people back in the Bible days used to tear their clothing and put sackcloth, or put ashes rather, on their head. But the scriptures tell us at the end of the Old Testament, the Bible says, don't tear your garments, but tear your heart instead. I love that line. I think about it often. The Bible says, tear your heart, come before me broken. In the book of Nehemiah, God's people were coming out of a time of captivity. It's actually what our message is about this weekend in the, rest, in the restart series. But the people have been a long way away from God. And, and I just read this, and, and I want the Holy Spirit just to speak to your heart. I won't even comment a lot on it. But the Bible says, the people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust in their heads. And those of Israelite descent separated themselves from the foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. In other words, people got honest about their own sins and the sins of their forefathers. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law, that's the word of God, was read aloud to them. Then for three hours more, they confessed their sins and worshiped the Lord their God. Well, of course, there was an assembly there. 
But you know the truth be told, I'm not sure that we need to do this in an assembly. Because in an assembly, sometimes it's too easy just to kind of get caught up in what everyone else is doing and go through the motion. I think we need to find a private place. We need to find an alone place. And confess the sins of our own heart and the sins of our people. And then we need to worship the Lord our God. As I close tonight, for some, this message was too much. For others, not enough. The truth is, there's so much more that needs to be said, but I didn't say these things in hopes of solving every problem. But I know this. Without these three things, are you hearing me, American Christians, New Springers? Without these three things, without repentance before God and our fellow man, without love, the kind God talks about, and without humbly getting right with God and confessing our sins and going back to what the Word of God has to say, without these three, we lose. We can't win. These three are essential. There are other discussions to talk about on other days, but these three are absolutely essential. Without these three, we lose. Mary Alice and I were driving back from Kansas City on Monday night after that appointment that she had and after I wrote most of the sermon. And the president was talking on the radio. I didn't catch it all. I just heard him say at the end, America always wins. America always wins. With due respect, Mr. President, that's not true. We don't always win. I wish it were true. We're losing now. We're way behind. In all the bravado in the world, in all the political posturing, it's not going to change anything. To close out this message, I give you the words of Amos chapter 5. In the 14th verse, the word of God says, do what is good. Do what is good and run from evil so that you may live. Then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper, just as you've claimed. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet, the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy. Thank you for listening tonight. And may God help us all who are Christ followers to find a place tonight to get honest before the Lord. May God bless you and may God help our broken nation.